you know, it's back to basics. Dave and I got talking about this, and this is one of our special edition webinars that the New England FAST team has done, considering we're all in these stay-at-home orders and similar things across most of the country. Uh, so we decided to do this, and we're looking at turning it into a FAAsafety.gov course, too, to be able to use in the future. As we built it, we did we wanted to keep it closer to 75 minutes. I think we're going to be closer to 90 minutes today just because things have gotten added in. But I hope that you do find it all worthwhile. Some quick questions that are always asked in the beginning is the credit for wings will be uploaded within a few days. Most of what we do on <clears throat> these webinars for the New England FAST team, we do load up on the Boston FAST team YouTube channel. Uh, most oriented towards airplane pilots, but very glider-esque. Landing out in ALC-629, gliding for the airplane pilot. You may want to take a look at those courses, definitely. And you definitely do want to take a look at the handouts tab uh, that we have up there is there's an advisory circular on the WINGS program, advisory circular for flight reviews. There's the notes page, back to basic questions and notes. There's a generic glider quiz that you can use for your glider, you know, irregardless of what make and model it is. And then there's actually a combined document, it's WINGS for gliders. And specifically, the first two pages are uh, little note thing that I had created to help people understand what they may have to do to be involved in the glider world and the WINGS program. The second part to it is what Dave created is Dave went in and took a look at all of the flight subjects um, flight portion, which is the most important portion or what most people have trouble finding, I guess. Is that a good way to describe it, Dave? Yeah, exactly. The system is really built for all different types of categories and classes of aircraft. The wings, the wings program, and sometimes um, when a new, uh, when a pilot will go into there for the first time and sort of look for things that are specific to them, it's not easy to find what you're looking for. So, so if you're, you know, somebody that's looking to just get started with the program, this lays it all out really nicely with some specific uh, flight topics that you can complete uh, for gliders and then use those as credit to meet the requirements towards your flight review. Terrific. So that's there and available. Uh, that is absolutely awesome for flight instructors. Dave gave it to me back a while ago. I have it tucked in my little knee board that I use when I'm teaching in gliders now um, in relation. It's just a good little quick check sheet to it. And there's uh, the last little part to that is a fact sheet from the FAST team on the WINGS program, which has some links to some videos and some other items in there that can help you out learn a little bit more about it. I did want to mention this too before we really do kind of jump into it. We are going to look at some sectional charts today, and we purposely tried to pick up on different glider areas from around the country with it. Um, as things change, we may not use all of these, but we're going to take a look at this area near Midlothian, Waxahachie, Texas, and where the Texas Soaring Association is, a terrific uh, operation out there. We're going to look also at Ingalls Hot Springs, Virginia, which is just a little bit north of Newcastle, which has some terrific ridge flying. Driggs, Idaho, and also uh, Triangle North Executive in the North Carolina area, uh, which is a little bit more, you know, thermal type activity, I think, for them. And here's us, if you have not seen us before, uh, in relation to it, is Rob, maintenance-wise, is not joining us today. He's one half of the Bradley Fast Team, but we have Dan Carter, is the Fast Team Program Manager for the Bradley FISDO. I'm Stephen K. Brown the FAST Team Program Manager for the Boston FISDO. The Portland Maine FISDO is John Wood. He is not joining us today because uh, we are so glider-centric. And then our WINGS Pro, Dave Strasberg. We're going to show this contact information at the end again, but there it is to begin with. And we want to thank you for joining us for part one, but 
as I think we've already mentioned, Dave, probably the most challenging part of a WINGS program for people is the part two, which is the application and the flying part. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of a lot of folks uh, take these courses. I know there's an abundance of webinars these days. I think I've done five or six this week. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time working on my knowledge items. But once we get back in the air and we get flying, we need to really take a look at those those flight topics and make sure we have really a, a complete um, system for maintaining that proficiency. Yep. And right now, while you're doing it, it's the time to develop a plan. Um, you know, I use the WINGS program. It's usually in the spring that it ends up getting reset for me every year. Guess what? For me, that got completely blown out of the water. <laughs> you know, I usually end up getting in a crosswind simulator, and I also usually end up um, getting together with an instructor in a tailwheel to just do a refresher on landings before the tow season starts. And I also do in the spring checkout. All of those things have what normally would be done by now have gotten blown out of the water. And you know, right now I think for some of us, our dogs are thinking that the aircraft has become a dog bed or, or something. But we have to look and rearrange. And also, you know, now is the time to prepare your aircraft. I had my glider. I put a little cut in my thumb from a slip of a slotted screwdriver. Uh, you know, fixing something on that. The spring and summer is just around the corner, so you got to start thinking about thunderstorms and spring and summer weather. So now is the time to take advantage of it. And a lot of people have jumped up, like Dave was mentioning, a lot of webinars and stuff out there. And Bert Compton contacted me the other day, which was terrific. In the upcoming issue of Soaring Magazine, he has a uh, article coming out called Corona Corrosion, uh, which is about the rust on the people and equipment that we've experienced it in these times. I think it's planned for the June issue, but he had given me a kind of pre-copy of that, and it's a great checklist and things to be thinking about for right now. And many of you have asked a lot of questions, you know, flight review questions and stuff like that. Pretty much, you know as much as we do as field office safety inspectors right now. Uh, the FAA does have this web page. If you go on the FAA homepage, you'll see it where they're keeping track of different things that have been um, adjusted, published, whatever it may be. Washington, I know a few weeks ago, talking to Washington, different departments together, they already had about 20, 25 things they were working on. Late this week, I got a little update from them. They're up to about 75 different things, you know, whether it be things associated with flight reviews, 6158 checks, cargo carrying and 121 aircraft in passenger. They're trying to make sure that this situation has as least amount of pain as possible for all of us on it. Um, so we will see things probably coming out in the future. Exactly what, how, why, don't know. I would encourage you to check the news lines is the alphabet organizations, especially those that have people in Washington, D.C., working with Washington folks at the FAA regularly, will probably be able to get the word out quicker than even your local FISDO office. Uh, so do keep your eyes and ears open through those channels. And today, working on preparing to be proficient is we're section one we're going to look at the risk and hazards and it'll have some poll questions about your operations and your fellow glider people section two will be scenario based questions and section three is things to think about more to cover with it as i did mention you know we're going to go through fairly fast but it is still fairly long um, due to limitations on the poll questions, we had to abbreviate and shorthand stuff extensively. So I do apologize ahead of time if it may be a little bit confusing, but I did my best to try to get it through. They only limit me to a certain number of character spaces on the answers and only to five um, answers to a single question. And the question can only be so long, so forth and so on. So there are some areas where I had to use shorthand um to make it make you aware of it you know 
So why are we doing this? We want to help you be proficient, but the question also comes up about insurance, and here's some typical things that you'll see in insurance uh, policies associated with clubs and other items. And, you know, everybody asks about, is there going to be an extension of the flight review or anything like that? Like I said, with the COVID-19, I don't know. Listen to the alphabet groups and everything. But probably more importantly, you want to recognize, is your insurance company going to cover you, even if, you know, there is that exception um, put out there by the FAA? That is a big, big question. And, you know, those of you that are using the WINGS program on an annual basis, like I know at least Dave and I are regularly, I think you are too, Dan. But if you're doing that, you don't have to worry about it. You know, I, WINGS program, I usually reset in the month of May. Probably it'll be June or July this year at least, but usually am. And it counts as the flight review. So my flight review is good all the way to May of 2001 because I've been involved in the WINGS program. And as I mentioned, we are looking at a future course on FAAsafety.WINGS. And then we got to think about the difference between a current pilot and a proficient pilot. And you want to talk about this a little bit, Dave? Sure. <clears throat> so we all know from the, uh, from the FARs that in order to exercise privileges of a pilot in command, you have to have a flight review every 24 months, which at a minimum is an hour of ground instruction and an hour of, of flight instruction. And that may be more depending on the, um, on the personal evaluation that's done by a flight instructor. And what are required within that, it gives some general guidelines, that has to be a review of the current general operating and flight rules of Part 91 and a, re a review of procedures and maneuvers uh, to exercise the safe uh, privileges of the pilot certificate. Um, not really tremendously a, a lot of guidance, it's just kind of a, a quantitative rather than a qualitative. And that's why Steve and I are such proponents of the WINGS program because it really lays out a plan to make sure that you have a broad base of proficiency and you're you know, evaluated in, a, in a, a variety of subjects or topics. And you know, for many of us, they go flying with an instructor. This, these are things that we might be doing anyway, but by logging this and checking certain boxes in certain areas, we can get the benefit of using this WINGS program to satisfy the requirements of a flight review. If you're somebody like a, a lot of my friends that I fly gliders with, they fly uh, jets or airplanes in their day job and they have uh, a proficiency program that's mandated by their employer that covers a very broad um, subject uh, profile. But uh, in, the, in the general aviation world, we don't always necessarily have that. So this really kind of allows you to have a program where you can kind of go through, and that's really a lot of what today is, sort of taking an inventory of yourself, certain situations, uh, and really design your own flight review specific to your needs. I'm going to slide right over here. So, uh, and uh, for the uh, pilot proficiency program with the wings, it, it has a component, which is a knowledge component, like what we're doing today. Um, and you'll see listed under there, you've got a number one, a number two, and a number three. And those are not just quantitative. It's not just about doing three knowledge topics, but it's about doing a variety. One topic has to be on aeronautical decision making. One has to be on private uh, primary accident causal factors, and the other can be an elective subject. And you'll see those listed, uh, two of the ALC courses that Steve has. One of those is a basic knowledge two, and the other is a basic knowledge three. So those courses will fill. I'm not sure what the, today's one is, but those will fill in those slots. And then you can go in and take a look at these other areas and do some um, activities to go ahead and complete that full profile. In today's, we have it split between a half credit for knowledge topic one and a half credit for knowledge topic two. So, you know, you re you would be really, really close to finishing up the aeronautical decision making. All you would need is an additional half credit for uh, ADM to, to get that after today. All right. So one of the first things you probably want to do is <laughs> going out there is get out the documents, uh, you know, with a spring checkout. And it, and I put some emphasis to this. Probably many of you joined us with the accident um, review or fiscal year 2019. And taking a look at those 17 accidents that we had, I know at least two of those pilots were out there 
still operating on their old paper certificate. Probably not as old as this, but still operating on the old paper certificates. And we, the FAA, started printing the certificates on plastic back in 2003, in July of 2003 when we did it. And we did have a rule change that everybody needed to upgrade pilot-wise to the plastic certificates back in by April of 2010. But yet we still had a few glider pilots out there operating that had never ever gotten the plastic certificate, still had the paper ones, which means to tell me, or which tells me that not anybody really had looked at it. And it's a good thing, you know, it, sit down with a flight instructor and go over what you've done in your logbook, what you may want to take a look at, what's been going on, you know, and it's also, you know, some other reasons. One of the things is verification for the club and the insurance. I know a few clubs that have had incidents and accidents. And then when, you know, the insurance company starts asking about it, like when was the person's last flight review or whatever, it's like, uh, it is the answer, <laughs> you know? So it is good once a year, at least, you know, get together with the instructor, just open it up, make sure you got it all. You know, it's better off to find the problem, you know, with a flight instructor at your local club and get it resolved quickly ahead of time than to find the problem when you've had an accident or an incident and then find out that maybe the insurance is not going to end up covering you on that. And another good thing that you want to check on, and this is good, is the aircraft. Making sure that you have checked the documents in the aircraft, whether it's your own personal one or also at the beginning of the season, it's good to have a couple people doing this at the clubs. You know, gliders can be a bit different. You know, some will require the manual, some may not. You want to check the type certificate data sheet. If you have an experimental air glider, which most people do, like I do too, you probably will have this pink airworthiness certificate with operating limitations attached to it. You want to review through those. Those are required to be kept with it. Uh, with very recent changes on FAA guidance, all airworthiness certificates now are getting printed in a white paper version like this off of standard printers and will just have the special or uh, standard airworthiness certificates. This is out of the um, latest updated version for airworthiness. The what is it, the 8130.2 Juliet. You want to check the registration too. It should have an expiration date that is beyond where you are. That's one of the interesting things. And all of these, I hate to say, it's good to check because gliders are out in the air and open. And if they're not secured well, uh, you could end up losing them. Doing check rides, I definitely come across lost paperwork on more gliders than I ever do airplanes. And that's just because they are out in the open. You know, if you're in a, let's say a 126 or a 233 or something, and it falls down in the bottom of it, it gets sucked out by the gear and disappears. Also that 8130.2 Juliet, this is something that a lot of people have talked about. You know, you get different recommendations or whatever, but FAA policy has changed on this, and this is right in the 8130.2. But now with airworthiness certificates, we encourage everybody to go ahead and protect the document by lamination or some other means. And that actually is right next to, it's in the document multiple times, but it's right next to this figure right there if you ever are curious and taking a look at it. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into the poll questions now. And this is section one where what we're going to do is go through a series of them. We got eight questions in this first series. And we want you to note to yourself what you may have experienced, vote on the poll, and also then take a look at what others have to say. What is an issue at other clubs or other glider pilots or whatever else it may be? So I'm going to go ahead and start working on opening up these polls, and Dave's going to have to help me quite a bit here. And we have it kind of oriented, associated with the practical test standards, kind of the different areas of operations 
with it. And here's the first poll question. And I'm going to go ahead and launch. All right. And let's see. It says it's distributing the poll. And I have experienced the following during aircraft rigging. So if you would, please go ahead and vote. The first few here, I'll talk a lot. We got 350 plus of you, uh, about 353, 354 people out there. And we, we want as many of you voting as humanly possible. You also, on the this section, you can vote for more than one item. If you've had two or three of these things happen to you, you should be able to click on them. So we, we can get a whole bunch. It's not going to add up to 100%. If you've only had one happen to you, you can click on just one. If you've had all five happen to you, you can go ahead and, and do it. So, all right. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll now, and then I am going to go ahead and share that with everybody. And as that comes up, Gabe, could you go ahead and kind of fill us in on what we had percentages-wise? Okay, sure thing. So uh, in, in first place, we have uh, failed to use a checklist at 56%, uh, forgot to install a battery or forgot cushion slash parachute, et cetera, at 20%. Next, at 19%, we have left the tool or unneeded supplies in the glider. Uh, next, we have rigged the glider in too small a space or difficult rigging at 13%. And then uh, at the bottom, thankfully at 6%, we have failed to connect to flight control or safety. Uh, I think that's Perfect. pretty, uh, I think that's pretty uh, in line with what I've seen. I think uh, there was a lot of moving parts and, um, in a glider operation and sometimes we're limited by the days of the week that we want to do them so we we may feel this uh, pressure or urge to try to hurry things along and um, definitely agree with uh, taking the time to go over that checklist and making sure that you haven't uh, left anything out there yeah and the checklist will probably help you solve a lot of those other problems you know the six percent that failed to connect the flight controller safety you know i emphasize there that probably has one of the largest impacts that's the type of thing that does lead to an accident and i also encourage people make sure you have a checklist take what the manufacturer has and maybe add to it i i use this as i have a rigging checklist that's broken into two parts that i use i've taken the manufacturer's checklist i've added to it but i have followed the or gone into the failed to install the battery or forgot the cushion or parachute uh, twice now in the beginning i forgot the battery and one i changed my checklist to make sure it was there two that also was a highlight to me on those days is whoa let me take a time out here for some reason my mind's not in it and both times i have done that i've talked to another pilot pushed my glider off to the side out of the way and I'm going for a walk for a little bit or something. For some reason, my mindset was not in it right now. I need to take a step back and do it. All right, let's go on to poll question number two. I'm going to hide that. Let's launch poll question number two. And can we see it? You can see it. I have experienced the following during pre flight procedures. So, like I said, we had 354 of you on right now. You can vote for multiples of these. You know, I will crack the joke about it being voting season. <laughs> vote early, vote often. But let's go ahead there. This one's looking a little bit more balanced, definitely. We're coming up for a minute. Please vote. Please, please, please. You know, get out and vote. Get out and vote. I, I need to practice for standing by the poll stations or whatever it may be come this uh, fall. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that, and I'm going to share that. And Dave, again, I'm going to need your help. Sure thing. Well, coming in there again at the top, failed to use the checklist. Uh, 
second place we have, or actually second place we have left on the ground food, water, recorder, oxygen, clothing. Certainly involves a, a landing and a retrieval for that. It's a lot easier to remember that before you take off. Um, third place, incorrect wind, canopy open or secured to the ground. Um, sometimes those latches uh, get a little bit worn with age, especially on some of the old gliders, or if you've got a person in the front seat that you're giving a ride to. Um, Definitely something to pay a little bit extra attention to. I have seen some canopies open. Um, and uh, also on the ground, that wind can be a little bit sneaky. I've, I've seen some gliders, unfortunately, damaged from that. Uh, blocks during ground tow or skipped in line at 14%. And then uh, coming in last at 10% hurt the glider due to improper ground handling. Terrific. Uh, I'm going to highlight on just one item myself, and it's that failed to use a checklist type of thing. I, I will readily admit I've worked in a few different realms of aviation and correspondingly you know in the glider world I've seen people rely more on mnemonic devices and memory versus you know a checklist that they can check themselves after doing a flow or something like that and it, it's been an interesting experience I know myself flying with a few airline types that also fly in gliders uh, you know, I've seen them using checklists so religiously because it just got drilled into them work-wise. And it's funny, they, they say they, you know, they feel almost naked not having the checklist. And, you know, that's one of the things that we find is failing to use a checklist many times leads to these type of things. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hide that one. We'll move on to the next one. Like I said, we got eight of them here. I'm going to launch the next one, and this is, I have experienced the following doing pre-launch or takeoff. And it is open. If you would, please vote. It is distributing. So we will let everybody vote there. What do we got? It looks like felt rush, but launched anyways, had wrong frequencies in the radios, used incorrect tow ring or knots in the rope, air brakes not stowed or latched, tail dolly still on. All right. And like I said, we've now got a couple more people that have joined us. We're pushing 360 now. We're going to about 63% of you have voted. Would like to have it up at 80% or higher, please. It'd be awesome. But I do know there's a couple groups that are also watching, so it's hard for everyone in the group to watch if they're watching off of one screen. I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm going to share it again, Dave. Okay, so I have experienced the following during pre-launch takeoff. Felt rushed, but launched anyway. Um, yes, definitely, definitely a, a problem. Um, I've seen that. I've been guilty of that myself, too. Um, if something doesn't feel right, you don't have to launch. Take a take a breath, and uh, even if somebody might get a little bit upset, it's a uh, it's better to uh, in the interest of safety, take your time. Uh, second place there had wrong frequencies in the radio. Yep, if somebody that flies with multiple glider clubs, uh, sometimes I'm on 22.7 when I'm supposed to be on 22.8, and uh, I have to land, and everybody says, uh, "Were you calling on the radio?" And I said I was, and then it's the wrong frequency. So definitely something you want to pay attention to. Air brakes not stowed or latched. Um, certainly have seen many situations. I know in the Grove that I fly, you can have the uh, air brakes closed, but unless they get that final pop, they're not actually latched. And as soon as you start generating lift, those will get sucked right out of the wing. Um, use incorrect tow ring or knots in the rope and tail dolly still on. And I'm gonna mention here with this one, there's another member of our community that is probably really important in all of these and that's the person wing running and helping you out is this i think you know a lot of clubs it does end up usually it's the newer pilots or the youth members that are doing the wing running type of thing and most people don't recognize how important they can be but you know they're the ones that either can help you stop from being rushed or inadvertently push you in into being rushed. They're also the one safety wise, you know, that they can help you with checking the tail dolly still on, the air brakes, you know, should be checking the controls. We'll talk about the tow pilot course or the um, wing runner course later on. But, you know, it surprised me. 
twice now. I've found people uh, with their seatbelts not clicked, <laughs> you know, on, saying, yeah, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> I found somebody, and I hate to say somebody in industry I know many years ago, we lost. Uh, but did not have, had their parachute with them, but had never connected it, had it as a cushion exclusively. And then uh, you don't want to be bailing out and not having that happen, you know, all sorts of things there. And I emphasize there that that's what, you know, the wing runner can really help you out with. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is during the actual launch itself and rolling along. So please vote here. Take a look at what you had for your operations, what you have had happen, and then vote on it. Again, you may have had more than one. Also, I'm sure there's some people we're going to take a minute or two with Dave and Dan after these first eight to take a look at um, things that we may not have been able to include or cover uh, that catches their attention and are good. So we'll take a look at those for a couple minutes. So we got about 57% of you voted. I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. We'll share it again, Dave, over to you. Okay, so we have uh, crosswind directional control issues. Um, Definitely a challenging time in a glider with a crosswind, uh, going from having no control to uh, changing levels of control uh, attached to somebody else. Um, I always tell everybody, I, you know, I think the takeoff is the most challenging time in the glider, uh, kind of the easiest thing in an airplane, and then the landing gives you trouble. But in the glider, in my experience, it's sort of been the other way around. So um, thinking about those things ahead of time is definitely important. Uh, trim this set, balloon or PIO. And then uh, next we have unlatched canopy certainly be a very startling experience. I know I've seen that happen on the field uh, before. Um, air brakes open, number four, and then number five, tail dolly still on. I will go ahead. Let's move on to the next one. I'm not going to... Let's see. During the arrow toe, and we did have to kind of choose one, this being the most prevalent uh, we did choose aero tow versus ground launch, you know, uh, winter or whatever, and also motor gliders. But if you do that type of operation, that's terrific. A good opportunity to get together with others, mentors and instructors that do that type of operation with you and maybe talk about what challenges you may see there. But we'll go ahead. I've experienced the following during aero tow. So we got about 61% of you have voted. We'll give it just a few more seconds. We got about 365 of you out there now. Go ahead and close. I'm going to share that again, Dave, as I do need in these. I do need help. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I have experienced the following during aero show, a large slack rope or rope break. Um, yep. Definitely uh, can be a problem, especially on those really bumpy days or when you're with a, a student that's really struggling trying to kind of stay on the horse there behind the, the plane. Uh, second place there, we have uh, too high or low on tow. Um, being able to be able to confidently control your position on tow is really a, a task you have to practice over time to make sure that you can maintain a proficiency at that level. Tow pilot issue. How about an unexpected maneuver? Tow pilot does something different than what you uh, expected him to do certainly causes a, a potential risk there for a, for a safety uh, event and then um, 
focused, uh, lost focus when flying on tow. Certainly uh, some beautiful scenery out there when we're flying. We need to balance our enjoyment with that with our focus on the task at hand. And then forgot tow signals are reacted improperly. All right. Yeah, so a few things there too. And this is what we're trying to do is get you to think about what is going on and more importantly, why is this type of stuff happening? You know, all of these are probably things we've experienced a little bit, but, you know, we're seeing it can be pervasive around some different things. You know, 23% of us lost, losing focus on flying on the tow. You got to think about that. If you're losing focus, not only are you endangering yourself, you know, if you're getting distracted by something, but when you're on tow, it's a combined partnership and your loss of focus has a direct impact on the tow pilot. And vice versa, you see the tow pilot issues, the same thing. You know, we were talking about the launching or the pre-launch. I kind of, talking to students, I will say, one way to think about this is the tow release when you're on the ground is a time machine. If you feel rushed or anything like that, all you have to do is pull it, and it's going to give you more time. And that's a terrific thing. You know, if you need to double check something or whatever, even after you've connected up the tow rope, just pull it. You can settle it out after the fact. You know, once you're on tow and once you're moving along and climbing out, it's a location device. And if your tow pilot is doing a maneuver that you're not expecting, you know, under most circumstances, you're probably in a safe location that, you know, you can stay at that location and let the tow pilot go off. And, you know, I've, it, it's not often, but I have seen clubs where you hear, well, this, you know, Joe Topilot does these things and I'm not, I'd rather have somebody else or whatever. You know, all it takes is a few pilots to start saying, I'm not comfortable with this and pulling off and releasing and coming back quick. The word will get around to the club and to the tow pilot is, hey, maybe we need to look at Joe because uh, they're not doing what is expected of us. And Dan, you're still with us. You've been answering some of the questions, I assume, and we're probably getting in uh, comments on these, I would hope. Uh, yes, Stephen. Um, we, some people are having a little bit of technical difficulties with the voting. Uh, one person oh, okay. logged out and logged, logged back in, and they were able to then vote. Uh, there were a few comments. That, I think we had three comments from folks that weren't able to actually click on the button and vote. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of people on the internet right now. Everybody's, uh, you know, hunkered down watching, watching movies. So that's, that might be part of it. <laughs> true, true. And, and we're going to come to you at the end of this, Dan, and take a look at uh, a lot of those things that have been brought up. Do apologize for the te technical difficulties. Um, that's not from our end. We don't have anything that w us three ourselves can specifically do, but that's good to know that logging out and logging back in work for that individual. And I did launch the next one, which is I have experienced the following during flight cruise operations is the best way I could kind of describe it. But this one, and we're just about a minute there. I'm going to close this and we'll share that. Okay. And if so you want to help us up here. Sure. So I have experienced the following during flight uh, cruise operations. Uh, we have uh, too close to another aircraft at the uh, top level. Certainly can be a startling experience if somebody's, uh, uh, you know, these white gliders flying around in the sky with these clouds and somebody comes up silently and you're not expecting them. That can be a bit of a, be a bit of a event. Um, unexpected wind drop, wing drop or stall. And then in third position, we have airspace intrusion or geographically challenged. Uh, I know a few times after uh, extended thermaling, I turn around and say, oh, gee, where was that airport again? And I'm flying in an unfamiliar area. It's really important to, to try to maintain your situation on your bear awareness and bearings at all times. Canopy open or other just significant distraction. And then in fifth place, we have unusual attitude or spiral dive. Back over to you, Steve. All right. Terrific. Well, that is interesting to see. And again, I'm going to go ahead um, and move us along. I hope that everybody is taking notes. Let's talk about the approach to the airport. 
And this is not actually the touchdown landing itself, but as you're coming in, setting up for the airport, I've experienced the following. And I'll launch that one. Hey, Stephen, this is Dan. Yes? Uh, one quick thing. Uh, I've had a bunch of people say that uh, for voting, if you uh, go to window mode and not the full screen mode, you can vote, then you don't have to log out and log back in. Oh, that is terrific to know. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to make okay. a note of that uh, just for future <laughs> reference. So okay. if they're outside of full screen mode, um, yes. you know, okay, that that is it's excellent. That is good to know. Yeah, if you switch between views between full screen and view and window, then it'll let you vote. It's uh, what I'm, I'm getting from several people. All right. Well, a little glitch anomaly associated with technology. We, none of us have ever seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the next one here, folks, and share that. We got a lot of voting on this one, definitely. A high percentage of people voting. Okay, so we have... Sure. I have experienced the following during approach to the airport. Uh, traffic conflict. Um, yep, that's where the conflict's going to happen with all of us trying to get to the same place. Uh, way too high or too low. Again, not a particularly good situation. You want to find yourself questioning your ability to get back to the field. Um, really ugly pattern. Uh, guilty there, but it's always a work in progress. Uh, poor coordination. And then in fifth place, we have set up for wrong runway or direction. And, you know, it, it is interesting. You're talking about the traffic conflict. In the glider world, it, it seems this way. It's either the rush at the end of the day as kind of the cross-country fleet is coming back, or if you have a lot of people flying locally and if, say, conditions end up shutting down, uh, soaring conditions, you know, the, the high overcast comes over and the thermals start to die out or whatever, you know, all of a sudden everybody is trying to get back to the airport at the same time. All right, so for this first section here, we have one more uh, we're... poll question. I'll go ahead and launch that one. And I have experienced the following during landing. So if you would, please vote there. And we're up to about 70% of you have voted. We got about 365 people out there. Just so you know, get an idea of, you know, we're getting a good sample of glider pilots, which is awesome. Excellent. We're up to about 75% of you have voted. I'll go ahead and share that. And this is the last question in this first section. And I hope you have been taking notes. But Dave, we'll go ahead. And bring that okay so to you. so we have uh, I have experienced the following during landing at the top position we have a hard landing and second position there inadequate airspeed control third position uh, bad crosswind technique or ground loop fourth position forgot landing gear or flaps and uh, in the fifth position hit something on approach or rollout Stephen? yeah and probably you know all three of us have said this over and over and over again. You know, a good pattern, precise flying leads to a good landing. You know, when we look at that hard landing at 57%, I, my first reaction to this is it's directly related to that 49% of inadequate airspeed control and that 25% of bad crosswind technique. And I forget the percentage number, probably someone put it down in a note, but. Um, on the last poll about the real ugly traffic pattern or the poor coordination. Um, you know, that probably goes right back to it. And then in the beginning, we were talking about checklists, but the forgot the landing gear or the flaps. I, I can't emphasize enough checklist discipline uh, in relation to this. All right, so there's the first section. I hope you have taken um, 
quite a few notes with that. Uh, found out what <clears throat> you've had as issues maybe that you want to work on and also take a look at what rest of the glider community is. And, you know, this is a, I snapped this picture when at where I fly, we had three different clubs flying there together on one day and all the differences between them. It makes me think, hmm, you know, I, I wonder what are the risks that people see at other clubs? And, you know, we had the survey. We'll take two minutes here. Dan, you know, what are some of the things that people brought up that probably we weren't able to cover in this survey? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Here's one uh, where someone uh, mentioned that the wing runner uh, caught that the tail dolly was on. And uh, oh, the person went on to add, I still owe that kid. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, you were talking about the, uh, yeah, kind of a shout out to the wing runners there. Um, let's see. What else do we get? Um, we had people talking about, um, mentioning the control checks and taking your time, uh, uh, not letting people, um, you know, getting back to not being rushed, especially during, uh, if when you're putting your, if you have your own glider, if you're putting it together, uh, just to, yeah. someone mentioned that. Um, uh, we had one where um, someone was approaching to land at a glider port and the spotter did not spot them as they were coming in. Um, so it's it's definitely a team a team effort. Uh, let's yep. see what else we got here. And I'm going to jump in there. That's a terrific thing to work on with your flight instructor, is doing some adjustments to your landing for the last minute. You know, if if you're kind of on that downwind base final area in the traffic pattern, you're probably not going to have the opportunity to adjust significantly, but you can adjust where you touch down whether it be laterally or horizontally on the runway um, in those type of things. And, you know, I've had a circumstance once where three different gliders for end up coming to the airport all at the same time, very, very close to each other. And, you know, trying to work that out, it gets to be a challenging decision and it requires some uh, fortitude and precision on the part of the pilot. What else did we have, Dan? Uh, well, this is kind of interesting. This was, uh, you know, a slightly different perspective. Here's one from a tow pilot uh, who noticed that there was some problems and uh, basically gave the pilot time to, you know, kind of catch up. You know, um, it was actually during flight, and he said that he, he leveled off. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, I know as, as a tow pilot myself, um, you know, the big thing I used to always watch out for, uh, I, was, I towed mostly the Grove 103. And as Dave was mentioned, you know, the dive brakes come out on uh, on takeoff. I had that happen to me. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, there was enough power with the airplane and enough, we had enough uh, room where I just was able to drag them up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I found that was pretty interesting. Um, a lot of people are mentioning Condor, Stephen. A lot of people are mentioning Condor during this time. Um, oh, yeah. You know, we're all, uh, yeah, it's a way to, you know, you were talking about the uh, Corona rust. I found that interesting. Yep. Terrific. Terrific. Yeah, that is. Um, my my son is more into it than I am, but that, that is a terrific yeah. tool out there, um, definitely. Yeah. Here's another tow pilot that mentions that um, he took off a full flaps and uh, no one bothered to say a word to him. <laughs> so, wow. You know, oh. Um, oh. <laughs> that's one thing I, I love about the, the glider community is uh, we all kind of have to watch out for each other. It really is a team sport. Yep. Yes. All right. And, you know, what – oops, sorry about that. I hit the wrong button. But getting into this is of the why. You know, why is it that we're doing this first little section here? And it's to help you understand what the hazards and the risks that you have to help you improve, you know, and discuss – that's what we want you to do. Discuss this with your instructor and your mentor. Maybe save the notes that you just had and bring that when you finally do your spring checkout. Or adjust your proficiency program to focus on these areas and root causes. You know, these are the type of things if you're doing the WINGS program or flight review, spring checkout, or even just getting together with an instructor to focus in on how do I adjust to make sure I do that. And to, 
help all of us see in the soaring community. Maybe what it is we're missing, what we're doing well, maybe what we can improve upon before we end up having, you know, some crinkled fiberglass and carbon fiber out there with it. So the next section is we're going to move into, we're going to have poll questions again. However, these are going to be scenario based. This is where we're going to start to take a look at the airports and some other things. And this is kind of focused in on what you may have to cover by the regulations on your flight review. But these are also good things just as refreshers each and every season for you. So here's the first one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show the question here, give you the slide picture sectional to look at, and then we're going to go ahead and go to the poll question from there. So you kind of can develop your answer and then vote on the poll and get to see what we have is the answer. So right here is we're going to look at an airport. We'll say you were launching in a rocket from Midway Regional. It's Waxahachie, Midlothian, Texas. What airspace would you climb through from the surface up to 20,000 feet? And this is kind of the classic flight review answer is, or question is, tell me what type of airspace overlies this airport. And here it is here. That is the airport right there. You should have enough information available to you from this picture to be able to figure that out. So, you know, Jot notes to yourself on your piece of paper. You're starting at the surface and you're climbing up. What airspace will you go through as you climb up to 20,000 feet? Give you a couple more seconds here to look at this diagram. <coughs> and we'll come back to the diagram after the poll question also, just so you can end up seeing what the answer is. All right, and Dave, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. What airspace would you climb through from the surface to 20,000 feet over Waxahachie Midway Regional or Midlothian? All right, we got about 35% of you have voted. We got about 370 of you out there now. Collecting responses, we're passing 50%, which is awesome. These questions from this point forward, you can only answer one. Uh, you can't <laughs> you can't game the system and choose. Well, I'll choose these three because I think one of them is correct. No, this one it's going to tell you directly uh, what people have chosen. So I'm going to go ahead and close that, and we'll share that poll. And Dave, as always, I'm going to have to ask your help. Okay. So uh, we have uh, the winner coming in at Gulf 700 feet AGL, and then uh, Class Echo airspace up to 4,000 feet MSL. Class Bravo from 4,000 to 10,000. Echo above from 10 to 18, and Alpha at 20. And then we had variations on the others as low as what looks like 5% to what was the next highest one? Uh, the next highest one was in percentage for the question, 700 yeah. AGL, and then Gulf up to uh, 4,000 MSL. Bravo from 4 to 10. So just the deviation there, uh, the difference in whether uh, we had echo at the surface or golf at the surface and what altitude that it went to. I think this is one of the really good things about this presentation is actually pulling out an unfamiliar sectional. Uh, we get really good at uh, our hometown, our home, our home area here. And uh, you know, by kind of branching out into another area like that and asking ourselves, it really tests our, our level of understanding, our ability to interpret that in an unfamiliar place. Yes. And tell you what, it is it looks like most people had the correct answer. I'm gonna ask you, Dave, just to 
talk about it quick, but I'll use the pointer. The first thing is that probably is important is this magenta shading. Yeah, that uh, tells you that the, the level that the echo airspace comes down to. And by the shape of that, that's telling you that there's probably an instrument approach that's being protected going into that airport. So you have yep. an airplane that's going to be gradually going lower and lower and operating, uh, and, and they're going to be busy maneuvering as they go through their checklist and drop their gear and make sure that they're configured and all set up. And uh, the glider thermaling out in that area as well um, may, may be a, a recipe for a, a close call. Yep. And so we have G up to 700 feet where it transitions to class echo airspace, which is the first controlled airspace. So below 700, you're in uncontrolled airspace. That continues up to 4,000 feet. And we actually have an outer shelf of the Dallas Fort Worth Bravo that goes from 4,000 to 10,000. Then above 10,000, it becomes class echo again up to 18,000 where it becomes class alpha airspace. All right, why don't we go ahead, let's move on to the next question, which is gonna stay right in the same spot, but it's gonna ask a different question about it, is what are the differences in airspace between KJY or K Kilo Juliet Whiskey Yankee, that's easier for me to say, and the TSA glider port, which is right next to it. And here's what we have as the answers. You'll see these again in the poll question. But what we're looking for is the differences. And here is Midway Regional, which we were just looking at, and we just determined the correct answer there. Right here is TSA Glider Port. These are two airports that have different types of glider operations, but close to each other. Uh, what is the difference in the airspace surrounding these? So if you would take a look at that, I'm gonna go ahead and open the poll in let's say three, two, one. And what are we at? We got about 370 of you out there. Again, I'm telling you that just so you know you know, when you look at these percentages, how many people are out there voting? And the more you vote, the better, even if <laughs> you're making your best educated guess. What it is, is we want all of us to get together and help everybody else out here. Even if you don't know the right answer, you know, give what you think is the right answer, you know, to see. Maybe you know more than you know or thought that you knew. Maybe it'll help guide you to what you need to maybe put some focus on so we're coming up on about one minute here we got about 55 percent please vote please vote please vote as it goes i'm going to close that and share it now dave okay so we have uh coming in first place uh csa out uh our mode c veil no overlying class bravo and the gulf goes higher to uh, 1200 feet agl Excellent. And that sounds like a really, really good answer to me. <laughs> Does it to you too? <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, I'm trying to hide this. Here we go. <laughs> what were you saying, Dave? I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, uh, if you're looking at this chart and scratching your head, really this whole course is about um, aeronautical decision making and taking a personal inventory of an area where you feel like you might need a review. So if you haven't looked at a sectional chart of the while at some place other than your home airport, this is an opportunity to dig in and do one of those free wings courses that uh, Steve is going to list on the uh, on the seminar here and uh, brush up a little bit in that area. Yeah, and when you take a look, right here is the edge of the Class Bravo. TSA is down south of it. Midway is there. TSA appears to be just outside of this magenta shading. Inside the lower 48, almost all Class Gulf airspace either goes up up to the 700 feet or up to near the 1200 feet. Um, it's very rare for us to see it go much, much higher than that in the lower 48 states. But outside the sharp edge of the magenta shading is tells you where the transition from Gulf to Echo is at 1200 feet 
AGL. A few people did jump at the 2,500 feet, which is just a distractor purposely there. And also, it's slightly outside of the Mode C Vale uh, in relation to it, which also is where um, ADSB is required now for airplanes and aircraft with electrical systems, that sort of thing. And Correct me if I'm wrong, Dan. Aren't uh, you and Rob doing a webinar on ADSB soon? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I don't remember the, the exact date, um, Stephen. I'm not sure if it's been confirmed, but that's something coming up in the next week or two. And uh, we'll be sending it out on um, fasafety.gov. Uh, it's going to go out nas national, so it'll go out nationwide. Yeah. I just checked the Perfect. schedule on that, and uh, Dan, it's going to be 6:30 on this coming Tuesday. Oh, okay. Excellent. Quicker than I thought. I will. <laughs> I will be there. You, Thank you know you what? For me so much time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I better work that day. No, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I guess it's already gone out. Did I stand corrected? It's already gone yeah. out. Is that right? Okay. Probably has, probably has, yes. All right, so next one we're going to move to uh, Ingalls, Virginia, uh, kind of ridge soaring type stuff. This kind of goes back into your home territory, Dan, so I'm going to ask you on these uh, next few questions here uh, to help out versus Dave. Uh, share the wealth, I guess, is the saying as it goes. <laughs> but uh, this is near Newcastle, Virginia, which is a popular soaring place. Um, also, some terrific soaring competitions take place there and everything. And we want to know what class of airspace you were in. And we're looking at differences between G and E airspace, specifically when you're flying in ridge lift. We're, we'll, on this one, just make the assumption that you don't have the capabilities to thermal up too high, that you can be at the ridge or slightly above. So. This is the area that we're looking at. It's near um, Bald Knob and uh, what is it, Bald Peak Mountain, I think, is what that 4,072 feet is. And just say you're down here in the southern end of this ridge soaring, ridge soaring. So I'm going to go ahead and launch now that you've seen that. What class of airspace are you in if you're down at that point? And what are the weather and visibility requirements? That's so again, if you would, please vote. Vote early, vote often. We're creeping up to 375 of you out there now. We get about 55% of you have voted. You can only vote for one answer now. The section one, you could vote on as many answers as you desired, but now we're just taking a look at one answer. And I'm going to go ahead and close this one. And I'm going to share that. And since we're getting into the ridge world, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you versus Dave, if you could help us out with this. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so you want me to read the, uh, the poll results here? Yeah, if you would, please. Just, uh, they're okay. too small okay, for no me problem. to read. Okay, so uh, the number one choice was uh, Class G, one mile and clear of clouds at 50%. And let's see, the number two choice was Class E, three miles, uh, 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 horizontal. Uh, the next choice at 17% was Class G, uh, three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, uh, 2,000 horizontal. And then uh, in last place at 9% was Class G, one mile, 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 horizontal. Uh, Stephen, do you want me to put it back over to you? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and hide this, and so we can go back to the screen. And most people did get it. Is just assuming ridge lift. It's highly unlikely that you would get above 1,200 feet above the ground. You know, in this case here, right over the summit. You know, we're talking 
almost 5,300 feet. It does depend upon the performance of your glider, yada, 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 so forth and so on. But, you know, most people just doing ridge soaring are staying fairly close to the terrain. And out in this area, class echo airspace does not begin until 1,200 feet. So you would be below that. And if you're below 1,200 feet and in class G during the daytime, i.e. gliders, we shouldn't, most people should not be flying gliders at night. There are some motor gliders and others maybe equipped and qualified for it, but that's very rare. Daytime, 1,200 feet within the surface. In class G, it's one mile clear of clouds. As you make the transition across this sharp line into the magenta shading, the floor of the class E switches from 1,200 feet AGL down to 700 feet AGL. All right, we're gonna stay in the same area, but ask a different question, but it is gonna be airspace related on the next one. And you're still having a great ridge day. You're near the airport, uh, close to Ingalls Airport, going up and down the ridge. We wanna know what class of airspace you are in there. So just a little bit north of your prior location, we'll go ahead and show you the map. And that's what it looks like. Again, having a great day. I'll give you a moment to think about it. And I'm gonna go ahead and launch that poll. So if you would, vote early, vote often. Please do, like I said, we'll get 370, 375 on of you out there. We got about 60% of you have voted, which is awesome. Again, the more votes, the better to give all of us the opportunity to understand what others in the gliding community are thinking. And we're coming up, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one and I'm gonna share it. And again, being Ridge, Ridge Lift, which is a world that Dan lives in. <laughs> oh, we'll turn it over to him. <laughs> okay. I, I don't, you know, I'm looking outside, I'm looking at the ridge right now. But um, okay, so let's see. Everybody was overwhelmingly voted for Class E at 81%. So they went with uh, Class E, three miles, 500 below, 1,000 above, uh, 2,000 horizontal. That was 81%, Stephen. Then uh, second place at 8% was a uh, class g one mile clear of clouds um then the next one at six percent was class g one mile 500 below thousand above 2000 horizontal and then in last place was uh class g three miles 500 below thousand above 2000 horizontal at uh, five percent well what is awesome here is almost everybody got the correct answer which is terrific and i'm going to go ahead hide that see if we get back to it and let's see uh you still looking at the poll it looks like it looks like i'm running into a glitch yes we're still looking at the poll right now okay let me click on that one again I'm gonna do share, I'll do hide again. Let's go back to the presentation. Let me try show screen again. I, I have a little image of what the audience view is like, so it looks like we're experiencing the technical glitch on our end right now. I'm gonna go ahead. That's not working. I'm going to go ahead and try stopping this for a moment. <laughs> and I will go back and do that. Sure. Hide. There we go. Excellent. Looks like yep. we got it now. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Well, we asked this question specifically. We're looking down here before, you know, talking about the class G. We mentioned that the floor of class echo changes from 1200 feet to 700 feet as we cross this magenta shading. And what's important to know here is 
take a look at this magenta ring. This magenta ring tells us that we have class echo inside of that magenta circle down to the surface. There is no class G down to the surface inside this ring, other than when it is specifically um, put in the chart supplement or NOTAM for the effective hours in relation to it. So we do have class echo airspace, which is probably the most prominent airspace in the United States. And that's why we get a lot of uh, good answers on that one, a lot of people getting it correct. Uh, Dave, you had mentioned this before. I, I purposely kind of cut it down, but across this ridge, what do we see these gray lines here that are going across? You brought this up and said, oh yeah, those catch my attention. Yeah, it's something um, initially when you shared the slide and we were looking at it without those being labeled, it doesn't immediately catch your attention, but those are some uh, military training routes cutting through that area. So um, this could potentially be a low level one that would be something else to be aware of. If, if they're buzzing through there, it would be a, quite surprising to see that coming at you. Um, yeah. And uh, also a little bit closer as you get closer to the airport as well too. So something else to, to to uh to really take a good look at the area that you're going to be flying if you're unfamiliar with it so you can pick up all those little clues and uh, potential issues there yep definitely and you know here's another good one is take a look at the airport information here and you know pay attention to what this altitude is and figure out what the altitude is of the airport i bring this up i have flown over this airport a lot over the years um, but it catches my attention from a glider perspective. This is looking to the Northeast. So this is the West edge, which is probably the most prominent um, portion of the ridge, if I do recall. But take a look, you know, for ridge soaring, a couple things is if you lose the ridge lift, it's usually down towards the valley that you're going. Even though you're passing by a terrific airport, you might be hard pressed to be able to use this airport as an emergency field if it's a bad day out there uh, for you. The other thing, you know, and this is uh, people that fly along the ridge, yeah, it looks fairly steep here, but as you get closer to the valley, it shallows out a bit. This is a different picture looking south, and you can see the same thing. By the airport, probably steep enough to be putting up some ridge lift, um, but the terrain is just maybe a little bit too shallow. Probably also, you know, has some opportunity for good wave action if everything sets up right. But if you're coming from the south, you may be up high enough to be able to duck into that airport. But if you're coming from the northern side on this ridge, you probably don't want to plan on using it as an outlanding field. Um, you know, the likelihood of being able to do that. And those are the little things you can pick up if you're going to a different airport, like Dave was saying, when you're taking a look. So this one's based upon the ridge, or flying along the ridge, uh, but not necessarily right at that location, is we're gonna take a look at an example where with a westerly wind, you're flying south on the ridge, you know, and for those of us at least on the east coast and probably more also on the west coast, you know, the prevailing winds tend to come from the west, so that is the west side of the ridge you typically would be on, but what happens if you encounter another aircraft on the ridge? Who has the right of way and what should you do? And here's my really bad uh, <laughs> photoshopping, but just doing it quick, taking a picture that I had from before and adding in another glider. So you're flying along and it all of a sudden looks like this. What should you do? And we'll go ahead and launch that poll question. I've heard people say duck uh, in the past, but you, know, you should do more than just that. So I'm going to go ahead and share that poll question. Still get about 370 of you out there. We got about 66% have voted. 
again, vote early, vote often. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now, and we'll share it, and we'll take a look. Who wants to jump in, Dan or Dave? I'll take it, Stephen. Okay. Okay, Go so, um, all right. Uh, this one was overwhelmingly 75%. First choice was the other aircraft has right away, and you should alter course to the right. That's great. Um, and yeah. then coming in second second place at 15% was uh, you had the right away, and you should alter course to the right. Um, yep. Then the... Uh, the next one was uh, you do, and they should alter course to the right. That was at eight percent, and then uh, at two percent was the other aircraft, and they should alter course to the right, and that was at two percent. Well, the majority have it, which is absolutely awesome. Here's just the diagram of what it may look like out of the um, glider flying handbook, and what you should be doing in that type of circumstance. Normally, aircraft approaching head-on, each would alter their course to the right, but, you know, in the glider world on ridge soaring, it's usually actually even a little bit closer than what that picture depicts on the aircraft to the ridge, and the aircraft closest to the ridge really doesn't have any way to go. So that aircraft that is on the outside and also the one that altering the course to the right would turn them away from the ridge is the one that does not have the right of way. All right, let's take a look at signals on tow. This is gonna be the next question. We're, I know we're getting near the end. We're gonna run through these last few here fairly quick. Uh, but what direction is the glider trying to turn this tow plane? And the glider is pulling the tow plane tail to the right. So let's go ahead and take a look at that one. We'll launch that poll. Vote early, vote often. All right, we've got quite a few. We'll close, we'll share that one. And I'll tell you what, we'll go back to Dave. We'll get some variety in this. How's that sound? Sounds good. So for this uh, okay. question, which direction is the glider trying to turn the tow plane? We have uh, in first place overwhelmingly is uh, trying to turn the tow plane to the left, which is uh, correct. Excellent, excellent. And that is true. This is actually the diagram taken out of the glider flying handbook. If you have the original publication of the Glider Flying Handbook, um, these pictures were shown incorrectly is what direction it was trying to turn. It has been corrected in an errata sheet, but uh, not everybody has necessarily seen that. That is available on FAA.gov. Now, this could be a similar uh, diagram to if you were boxing the wake. Uh, a couple different things to just recognize there is a standard practice and what we recommend in the glider flying handbook is before starting to box the weight that the glider will go from the high toe position to the low toe position and that's partly to signal to the tow pilot that they are boxing the weight also based upon you know the diagram you don't it's hard to see but you the rudder is um not over to the side is the pilot would have to have quite a bit of rudder input here to actually keep from the tow plane being pulled around. We're going to talk about signals again. The next one is we're not going to look at the picture until after the fact, but here's what the next poll question is, and I'll go ahead and launch that. And then I'm going to actually go to you on this one because you said as a tow pilot you've seen this <laughs> okay um, uh, right. to <laughs> let me <laughs> so i'm going to go ahead and close this poll and then share it is it sharing there we go 
All right. Yes. Over to you, okay. Dan. We got it. All right. So um question was, what is the signal from the tow plane to the glider to immediately release? And 89% uh, uh, overwhelmingly voted for a rocking of the tow plane wings. Um, Excellent. Yep. Which is good. Which is good. Yeah. And here's kind of the signals that people tend to get confused uh, in relation to it. The signal that we're looking for for release immediately is a significant rocking of the airplane wings. The one you were talking about earlier is something's wrong with the glider, specifically like you mentioned the air brakes on the globe and fanning the tow plane rudder back and forth. I think you mentioned it, which is one of the things that a lot of people recommend if you're flying tow planes that have enough horsepower is wait <laughs> to to do that fanning of the rudder. It's, you know, just if you got the horsepower, drag it up and over, drag the glider up and over the airport first before giving the signal. All right? What was the circumstance you had? I, you, you were telling us a little bit before, but fill us in a little bit oh. more. Oh, um, well. It was just uh, it was just a classic, you know, the, the grobe, um, the, the die brakes weren't locked and, and they came up uh, on takeoff and I could feel it as I was as I was towing and then I could see it in the mirror and, um, you know, didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it too much, but, uh, you know, I, had, I saw that I had plenty of plenty of room and plenty of horsepower. I was in the, in the Pawnee and uh, was able to, uh, you know, drag them up to altitude and then I saw that the... Uh, I think I might have given the signal. I don't remember now exactly, but I remember that the die brakes they did they did stow, and I could I could actually feel it in the tow plane as the performance increased, and and I remember talking about it afterwards, and that was pretty much it. It was a, a nice ending. Yeah, good. And one of the things I've heard in terms of radio, if you do see that happening, is I've heard people recommend just say dive brakes. Don't not necessarily like. Um, using a lot of verbiage with it like you know yeah when they three your eyes yeah because you yeah. know people may end up overreacting so here's the next one right. we have i the next question is on collision avoidance we're getting to the end we may run a little bit longer i apologize i'm looking at the time but here's the diagram we're out here in this area um just thermaling having a great day soaring you know it's not that high of terrain. The airport is only about 368 feet out here. There's multiple glider uh, ports around the area that we can end up flying at with it. But the question is, and I'm going to go ahead and launch this, is you're thermaling and passing through about 5,500 feet MSL, that's above mean sea level, just west of the Triangle North Airport. And that's about all I can see on the question. But I, if I remember correctly, it's like, where would you expect traffic to be coming from? And this is this is the type of question. A few of these questions are almost identical, if not, uh, to the Soaring Society of America bronze badge test. And that's always a terrific thing. They have a about 300 question test bank that you can practice on and now even have updated it so you can do it by different subjects, updated the questions, all of that. So that is terrific. I'm gonna go ahead and close this one and I'm gonna share it and I'm gonna to go to you on this one, Dave. So we got the results up. You wanna Cover the results, Dave. Don't know if you're on mute by chance. Just double check. Uh, my batteries just ran out of my headphones, so I uh, switched them. Oh, really did it? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I was scrambling. <laughs> yeah. just, I'm sorry, I'm on mute. It's been the story of my life these last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thermaling at 5,500 feet MSL west of Triangle North Airport, what direction would you expect VFR traffic to come from from the west heading east? So, that's definitely a situation of uh, as a glider pilot, you may not always necessarily be thinking about uh, cruising altitudes, but having an awareness of what the other guy is doing can certainly help with your decision making process. 
Yep. And the hemispheric cruising altitude rule, 91159, I'll say that unless you're holding of a pattern two minutes or less or in the process of turning, you know, and this is for the powered aircraft, is, you know, on a magnetic course that you are specifically going eastbound, magnetic course too, you know, it's odd thousands plus 500 feet above 3,000 feet AGL. At 3,000 feet AGL is where that takes place. So most people did get that one correct. You would expect that traffic to be coming from the west, heading in the direction to the east. All right. Here's a good question. Who is responsible for determining if a glider is in a condition safe for flight? And hopefully for all of us looking at a glider like this, that's an easy question. <laughs> But we'll go ahead and launch that one. Oh, I like the answer on this one. This one's an easy one. And we got a huge amount. I, in fact, just timing wise, we got so many people that are right on on this one. I'm just going to share it right away. We had 70% of people voting right away on that one. So this was an easy one for everybody. It is the pilot in command. It is, you know, and then it's the owner or operator that is responsible for maintaining the aircraft in an airworthiness condition. The certified mechanic, basically in all reality, they're a contractor to the owner operator. That's who they are required to use is someone that is, you know, appropriately rated mechanic on a standard airworthiness aircraft. Um, yeah, and they assist the owner in maintaining the aircraft in an airworthy condition and can check it and basically tell them that, yes, they believe it is or believe it's not. But it's the aircraft owner for airworthy condition. It's the pilot in command in a condition safe for flight on there. All right. Right away rules. Let's go ahead and move into this one. You're on the right downwind and the tow plane is on the left downwind. Both of you are being the numbers. Who has the right of way? And you're kind of looking up at the tow plane like you see here. I'm gonna go ahead and hide that just so you can see the picture. The picture can help you out a little bit to give you a little bit of an idea. And we'll launch this poll question. Do thank you for staying on. Like I said, we are running a little bit longer. This is our first time doing this one. And we got a lot of votes here. This is another good one. In fact, timing wise, it's so good. I'm going to close that one and share it pretty darn quick. I don't even know if we have to have discussion on this one, man. It's all right. Good job, everybody. We had 71% of you vote and 99% of you did recognize that you and the glider would end up having it. All right, the last two questions are based upon currency. And we're just gonna assume, we know this is not the case with all of you, but we are going to assume that you are rated in both airplanes, single engine land, so maybe you're a tow pilot too, and also in gliders. If you're gonna fly your single place glider and just to meet the regulations for currency, we're not talking proficiency here, we're talking currency. What do you need in order to act as the pilot in command? So we'll launch that one. And this one we are definitely, it looks like Dave and Dan, a little bit more of a spread on the percentages. Vote early, vote often, please, folks. <laughs> no, you can only vote once, but voting early does help. And we're up there around that 75% or so, so I'm gonna go ahead and share that. And I'm gonna go to Dave on this question, uh, but Dan, I'm gonna go to you on the next one. Okay, so the question is, uh, what do you need in order to act as PIC in your single place glider? And in first place, we have flight review uh, within the past 24 months in either. Uh, second place, flight review in, in either and three takeoffs and landings in 90 days in the glider. And then uh, third place, we have a tie 
of flight review, 24 months, three takeoffs and landings, uh, both, and then uh, and flight review in the glider, and then three takeoffs and landing in 90 days in the glider. So this is kind of a this is definitely a question of what can you know what can you do versus what should you do. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so if, if you know you can comply with the rules, you can be current, but are you necessarily going to be proficient? Um, it's one of the other benefits of the Wings program is you can uh, you can participate in, in in different categories and classes of aircraft over time, and so give yourself sort of a system. If you're somebody that flies a single engine land and multi engine land and seaplane and glider, uh, go in uh, pr have a, a variety of experience instead of rather just trying to meet what the regulations require you to do. Yep. And the correct answer is technically the flight review in either um, in relation to it is you don't, you may not have even flown gliders in five, 10 years and you technically could go jump in. You know, people talk about the regulations and, you know, the saying written in blood or whatever. When you look at the regulations, they don't care much about just you, the pilot. They really care about the passengers that you're taking. And a flight review is if you're doing a specific flight review, it's required in an aircraft in which you're rated. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be in the category of aircraft that you're flying. So you could do it in a single engine airplane and then go jump in single engine or single place glider, excuse me, right away. All right, so let's change that up a little bit and look at the next one. And this will be our last question today. And then uh, we'll run through some things to finish up and then let you on your way, but we'll stay on to answer some questions, is now you're flying a two-place glider, and we're going to change it up a little bit here. We're going to say you're flying a something that is a two-place motor glider, uh, such as this Pipa Strahl, uh touring motor glider here, is what do you end up needing in order to take passengers there? And this will be our last poll question. So if you would, vote early, vote often. We're getting there. We got still 365 of you with us. We're passing 40% of voting. We'll go ahead and we'll say five, four, three, two, one. We'll close that. We'll share it. And I'm going to go to you, Dan, because I got a follow up question for you since you're okay. a motor glider guy too. <laughs> By the way, I hadn't seen that picture before. I didn't, I was having technical issues when we ran through this. That's actually, uh, that's a picture of my wife and I's uh, motor glider, our old motor glider, and we were taking off out of Oshkosh. We just saw someone put that on the web. So I was kind of, kind of laughing to myself when I saw that. Um, oh, yeah, that, okay. you must have given that to yeah. me back when you first started then, because I, I pulled it out of my... Oh, okay. Um, that's being pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. We don't we awesome. don't own it anymore. We sold it. Uh, we sold it over the winter. But uh, uh, anyway, okay. So, what do you need in order to act as PIC carrying a passenger in a two seat glider? Uh, Seventy one percent. Number one, first first choice was flight review. Uh, Twenty four months and either three takeoff landings and ninety day glider. Um, so that was pretty pretty overwhelming right there. Yeah. Do you want me to continue? Okay. Yeah, actually, I'm going to I'm going to pose the question to you because I get asked this all the time uh, and you okay. deal with it and flying these type of aircraft. These are the touring motor gliders is probably where the question comes up more often is that, you know, takeoffs and landings in the 90 days. If you're doing it in a motor glider like this, does it technically count for airplanes? Uh, yeah. Okay. So um if you look at the reg uh 6158 it's on it's 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 category class and type so the 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 airplane the aircraft you have in the picture there that's a pipistrel motor glider that one is registered as a glider so that's the category so that would not qualify for another class or i'm sorry another category such as airplane in other words you have mm -hmm. to have specific for uh airplane and specific for glider Yep. And and we get people that ask that all the time is even though they may be very similar, <laughs> it, it yeah. doesn't count. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah, you look at it, it looks like you look at it, it looks like an airplane and uh that's where the confusion comes in. The other one I used to always get asked was um you know, can I fly that can I fly that with my private pilot airplane? And it's like, no, it's no. It's, it's registered as a glider, so you you can't. And uh then the follow-up question is, well, I promise I won't turn the motor off. What I don't ever plan on turning the motor off. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, it's, yep. it's still it's still like a glider and you have an airplane. Uh, so the, the, the aircraft has to match the pilot certificate. So. Yeah. Exactly. And of course, All then, right. and the this, last... and this one, you also... sorry, go ahead, Steve. Oh, no, no, go right ahead. Uh, the other thing, of course, you need the self-launch endorsement, but uh, I don't want to get off track no. there, but okay. Yeah, that's true. All right, just finishing up here, there's always more to cover. Um, you know, we've done a lot today. We went through 20 questions. Hopefully it's helped you learn something. Hopefully it's also helped you look at other people in the glider community. But some of the different things, you know, each airport that you fly out of is unique, different. You know, we can't cover it all. So you want to take the time to, to go over your local operations, the airports with nearby landing fields and that, you know, you need to start thinking about these large subjects. And what we would recommend, I do this myself every year, you know, but always each year take the uh, wing runner course that's on the Soaring Safety uh, Foundation. I do that every year in the spring. It's a terrific review. Uh, yeah, okay, I probably know most of it, but, uh, you know, it's always good to review that. Also, the tow pilot course for those that are out there towing, you know, do it annually. For the glider pilots, it may be a good additional review, give you a little bit different perspective in relation to it. You know, we need to cover all different things in part 91. Did we cover oxygen rules today? No, we did not cover oxygen rules. So if you're using oxygen, you probably want to do that. Same thing with parachutes. You know, you want to make sure that you're familiar with that. And aerobatic flight, if you're doing that sort of flying too uh, with your gliders. Some gliders are capable of doing it and you want to take a look at that. And the last thing, you need to know your glider. One of the things I recommend doing, every type of aircraft that I fly regularly, I end up, if it's not available from the manufacturer or the school or whatever else it may be, I create a glider quiz the first year. And every year I take that glider quiz also. It's just a good way to review the specifics for that glider. And posted up in the handouts is a generic one, if you want to download that to help yourself out. Even though it's mostly focused around the Washington, D.C. area, I recommend this um, for all pilots that have a private pilot certificate, even if it's just awareness and you learn some about uh, special air traffic rules and everything. It is a requirement within 60 miles of the D.C. area, as you can see as indicated by this and there's special awareness training, but on fasafety.gov, there's ALC-405 course that was recently updated with some recent changes. And probably the biggest thing I can recommend to you as we get right here close to the sign off today is the I'm safe. You know, we always talk about this, you need to review this. An absolutely awesome way to review I'm safe is to maybe take like the AOPA basic medical course. You don't have to do basic med, you know, you can actually take the course on its own. I recently did it about four or five months ago. Uh, I had always heard good things about it and I took it myself and I was impressed. There's also one available from Mayo Clinic. I think the login structure is a little bit different there, but I've heard absolutely awesome things about the basic medical course put on by the Mayo Clinic too. So we do want to thank you, you know, and, you know, a big part of it, we all do push for being proficient pilots. We use the WINGS Pilot Proficiency Program, which you can find out more information, you know, and all you got to do is a couple quick things. Dave is one of our WINGS Pro. You can reach out to him or the WINGS Pro's in your area can help you out. If you want to learn more about the WINGS program, you can take a look at these videos. That'll help you out. You can do a screenshot of this. 
Also, what a lot of people don't know, we've done this for the last couple of years, is there is the Wings Industry Advisory Committee, which has created basically a sweepstakes for it and $10,000 worth in sweepstakes prizes. I think four prizes at $1,500 each, which basically will cover your cost. So we do want to thank you from the New England FAST team. This is us here, along with our contact information with it. If you do need to get in touch with us, that's how you can. And always there's some housekeeping questions at the end. Do take a look at the handouts tab for things there. If you're looking for the WINGS credit for this, we'll get it uploaded in the next few days. We usually post recordings up on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel, usually about one week after. A couple interesting things that are posted up there that you may find interesting is the Glider Instructor Webinar, a review of the fiscal year 2019 accidents. Also, we recently did Flying Safely While Aging Gracefully. They say I'm in that group, but so are most other glider pilots that uh, we're well aged, we're like a fine wine. That's a good way to look at us and our pilot capabilities too. And then also good pilot, better pilot, proficient pilot in those wing courses there. So I do wanna thank you. We'll stay on for a little bit here to answer any questions that you might end up having uh, with it. But we do wanna thank you. You don't have to stay on for the question and answers. Uh, you're more than welcome to. You'll get credit for this uh, without staying.